So this is Reginald Macklin from RMC News. We're here at Representative Kendra Horn's town hall meeting here in Bethany. Uh, we'll be providing a video of the entire event. So, and we'll be posting it to our YouTube page. So anyway, we're about to start. Welcome everybody. We're, we're very glad that you're here to join us. And we are going to start off today. We have a, a few troops of, of girl and boy scout troops that are going to lead us uh, in the presentation of the colors and uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you could all stand. Go to our attention. Those not in uniform, please put their right hand over their heart. Go to our forward mark. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we give them a, a, a round of applause and say thank you? For your time today? I keep wanting to say good morning, but I know it's uh, early afternoon. So if I if I say good morning, you'll you'll know that I'm I'm just uh, I think the cold makes me think it's morning, uh, and and especially as it's been what 50 or 60 the past few days. And, and eight this morning, and what, 50 or 60 tomorrow? Uh, uh, people living in other places say, okay, we put away our, our summer uh, wardrobe and, and bring out our winter. And in Oklahoma, basically, you can wear all of it in one day. Uh, that, that's when, so when people ask me that haven't been to Oklahoma, what's it like uh, being in Oklahoma in the summer? I say it's basically like living in a blow dryer. You step outside, and, and the hot wind hits you. Uh, but but thank you so much for braving the cold. That's all to say. Thank you for braving the cold and for participating and for being out here. Uh, I see many faces that have, have been and attended at previous uh, town hall events, and we're glad to see you back, and some new ones. So what I like to do is just kind of uh, set a foundation of, of agreements and how we'll move through this and let you know that we'll give as many people an opportunity to ask questions and an answer as, as possible. Uh, but. Since I know we are all in agreement on every single issue and there are no disagreements and nothing controversial that will be addressed, uh, you know, I'm sure that we won't have anything really to, to, to worry about. Uh, but, but seriously, um, I know that many of us have uh, different opinions on a lot of things. Um, that is life. I, I don't know that I've ever agreed with any one person on every single issue uh, that has come up. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about those, whether we agree or whether we disagree, and do my best to answer your questions about uh, what's happening and why I'm making the decisions that I'm making, the work that we're doing, and, and how we can work together. So laying that foundation, uh, what, we, what we do is, uh, first I want to bring to your attention, because I think it's important, uh, that there are numerous uh, cameras in the room. So uh, if you prefer not to be filmed, um, please, please note that uh, there are cameras in the room and we are on Facebook Live, so that's a, another way to, to consume uh, if, if you prefer not to, to be uh, filmed. And also, when we're talking about questions and going through, uh, each of you have the opportunity to pick up a ticket when you came in here today. Uh, and if you dropped the other half of that ticket into that clear box, uh, the, way that, the way that we do questions in order to try to get through as many as possible and, um, and just to make sure that we're just uh, opening it up to whatever your thoughts and concerns are, is I will draw uh, those tickets out and read the number, and if that's your number, that's your chance to ask a question. 
and we will have uh, one of uh, my team members come around. Uh, Trent, are you doing the, the microphone? He's, he's gonna bring the box and we'll, oh, Richard in the back who's waving his hand uh, is gonna be uh, coming to you with the microphone. He'll hold the microphone, you'll ask your question uh, and, and I'll answer it. And uh, the thing that I'll ask everyone is one of the most important things that, uh, that, that I was always taught growing up is that the golden rule and um, we treat others the way we want to be treated. So um, asking and answering, um, I promise that I will listen and, uh, and then respond and, and in order to keep us going, uh, that we treat everybody with dignity and respect as we go through this process today, even when we disagree. So um, having said all of that, laying, laying those ground rules out, first of all, let me say thank you so much for being here again. Uh, one of the most important things about uh, representing uh, of diverse uh, segments of people and communities is that we all have a lot of different experiences and concerns and I wanna hear from you. Last year, I'm gonna go over just a little bit of uh, summary of what happened in, in 2019 and what we accomplished and, and cover a few of the bigger issues that I know are going to come up today just to lay some foundation and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, but, but I wanna start with some of the things uh, that we did last year. I think it's uh, it's really important. The most important thing to me is that uh, that that we are being accessible, and that's why we held a record number of town halls last year. We had a total of 17 town halls and community coffees throughout the year, and we'll continue that this year, um, having even more across the district because it's really important for me uh, to hear from you what what thoughts and concerns uh, you have, and and for me to be able to share what we're doing. In fact, it was at our first town hall of the year in uh, 2019 that, that I found out about the, uh, the problems with housing, base housing at Tinker and then around the country that led to uh, us through the defense authorization bill uh, passing a record tenants bill of rights including $140 million for addressing those issues and we'll continue to do that. So those are the kind of things, um, whether it's big or small, that we're able to address. And just last year, here are some numbers that I just am very proud to share that uh, it's, not, it's not just me, it's, it's the staff and, and the in individuals that work here on the ground, and we work to help people every day. Last year, we closed almost 400 cases, which means we helped uh, 400 different, or 371, I believe, uh, different Oklahoma families and individuals in the 5th District with issues that they had with a variety of federal agencies and recovered uh, over a, a half a million dollars in taxpayer funds uh, to two individuals in the fifth district, uh, as well as our town halls. And uh, I personally, and this isn't counting, uh, all of the team members attended uh, almost 300 community events last year. Uh, so I say all that to say, um, I wanna keep hearing from you because when we're going through these issues, sometimes we're gonna agree and sometimes we're not, and you never can tell where those things are gonna intersect. But I also want to talk about how we closed out the year and what we accomplished, because I know there's a lot going on, and sometimes the good things, the things that we accomplished, can get lost in some of that chatter. So in the last month of 2019, uh, we were able to pass the, well, pass the uh, USMCA out of the House of Representatives. It was a, it was a long, uh, a lot of work to get there, but I'm really proud of where we got to, and we're hopeful that the Senate will be taking up a vote on that soon passed the defense authorization bill, which not only included historic protections and, uh, and fixes for the housing system, uh, it also included 12 weeks of paid parental leave for all federal employees. It included a fix to the widow's tax. It included uh, modernization, enforced modernization efforts and, and a lot of other things that are incredibly important uh, to our nation's armed forces. And we worked. This is one of the areas where if, if somebody asks if there's anything getting done on a bipartisan basis, we worked across the aisle. I was a member of the conference committee and we worked really hard to get to a yes on that and to get it done and to ensure that we were addressing not only the material needs but the human needs of the men and women serving in uniform and supporting their families uh, here and, and when, when they're stationed abroad as well. We also funded the government, which is something that I shouldn't be have to be bragging on, but quite frankly, being sworn in in the middle of a historic shutdown that no other incoming class of Congress has been sworn in in the middle of a shutdown, uh, it is something that I'm incredibly proud of because we stayed at it. 
We got to a budget deal earlier in the year. The House passed all but two of our appropriations bills before the end of June, and we stayed and got it done. It was not easy because we have to work together, but that's the way it should be done, and that is something that should be our top priority. Putting aside things that are solely partisan so we can get to work for taking care of the people. The other thing that we did just before the end of the year was pass HR3, which is a bill that would address the astronomical and rising costs of prescription drugs. It included a provision, uh, a bill that I authored uh, with one of my colleagues that, that would have, that if enacted, would reduce the cost burden on seniors under Medicare prescription, or Medicare Part D for prescription drug costs by up to $3,100. And that was just in the last month of last year. We were a little bit busy. Now, I wish we had spread that out a little bit more, but nonetheless, we did that. And so closing out the year, I think it's important to note that we did get a lot done. And all of those things I just mentioned were done on a bipartisan basis. And I think that is incredibly important to note. Uh, so, pardon me for just a moment. I can't seem to open a water bottle with one hand, so. <laughs> okay, that's better. Um, I'm not gonna close that. So, so all, all of that to say, there's a lot to be done. And there was a lot we did do. Now, I'm sure that, um, well, I know I was hoping that the year would start off in a little bit more uh, slower pace that we could ease ourselves into it, but sadly that's not the case. So before I turn it over to questions, I, I want to address a couple of things that I think are on the minds of, 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 many, of, of many people in this room and many people that, that have had questions and, and that have questions. Um, and just starting um, sort of chronologically moving up to this point, I think the first the first question uh, that many of you had was uh, my vote on, uh, on, on impeachment in December. So I ran for Congress to serve the people of Oklahoma in the Congressional District because I heard from families over and over again about their struggles with making untenable choices about whether or not they're gonna put food on their table or get prescription drugs they need, their fears for their family members losing uh, access to health care, the closure of rural hospitals across this state, and so much more. And that is something that I have and will continue to fight for. I ran to fight for education and so many other things and to reach across the aisle, and I have and will continue to do that. In fact, I'm very proud of the work that we've done last year introducing and co-sponsoring uh, over 300 bipartisan bills and being a part of getting bipartisan bills all the way through and signed into law. Having said that, I do not believe that uh, partisanship should lead anything. I didn't go to, to DC seeking that, and I was not someone calling for that. In fact, I am troubled by the extremes on either end of the spectrum. Those people that were calling from impeachment for the word go because I don't think that's helpful, uh, and those people who would seek to derail the process. At the same time, when I was sworn into office and raised my hand, I took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, and that means that means working with individuals of both parties when it is for the right thing, and that means standing up to my party or the other party when that is what is called for. I did not take the decision lightly, and it was something that I spent a lot of time and thought and, and analysis and, uh, and, and reflection on. And ultimately, I was faced with two questions, and the reason that um, I, I would not make any decisions before I knew what those questions were because it very much depends whether or not I'm gonna vote on a piece of legislation, what is actually in it, and what it does, and what it says. And the two questions were this. One, uh, was there an abuse of power? And two, was there an obstruction of Congress? To the first question, uh, no, no president of any party ever should ask a foreign nation to put their thumbs on the scales of our elections and interfere in our elections. It is, our democracy is founded upon free and fair elections and that is in and of itself an abuse of power. The, the second was, was there an obstruction of Congress? We have three co-equal branches of government and the Congress, the House and the Senate have our responsibilities under that. And the administration refused to comply with any subpoenas 
produce documents or to to even allow witnesses, current or former uh, administration staff, to participate in the process. That in and of itself is an obstruction. So I came to the decision that I had to, to vote for the articles. I did not do so with, with joy. I, I was not happy about being there, but I have to make decisions based on what's in front of me. And at the same time, continue to focus on all of those other things. Passing prescription drug pricing relief, passing the USMCA, which I fought hard to get, working to ensure that we ended the year with a fully funded government that was not on a continuing resolution because we've got to stop kicking the can down the road on things like that. And I've never stopped and will not stop working on those issues. To the second question um, of the events of the past 10 days. Uh, the resolution that came before the House two days ago, uh, let, me, let me be very, very clear. My top priority when we're talking about the safety and security of our nation and our forces and those of us serving in uniform is, is the safety of Americans, those serving and those living here and abroad. And sometimes uh, that means that, that we have to go out and defend ourselves. It means we have to go after people who are bad. So I'm not shedding any tears over the death of Qasem Soleimani, who was uh, absolutely a terrorist responsible for the deaths of hundreds of Americans and thousands of others. Now, that does not mean that we give any president, any administration a blank check. It does not mean that we as Congress should just say, okay, you do what you want. And my vote on Wednesday was, or, or Thursday, was absolutely not about that. But. We have to, do, there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. And quite frankly, I'm tired of things turning into these big partisan fights when they are too important. They're too important for everybody in our communities. That resolution would, was not have the effect of, of further limiting action, but we can't tie the hands of an administration, but we need to do it the right way. That turned into a partisan issue that that divided people further. But what has been happening over the course of the past several decades is that Congress has been ceding our power and kicking our can down the road. <clears throat> right now, we are operating under an authorization of the use of military force, an AUMF, which is the legal authorization that Congress gives. And Congress has the constitutional duty to decide when and where we send our troops. And quite frankly, I don't want to see another reckless, endless war. We deserve better than that. That's not, what, that's not the thing that's going to keep us more secure. But right now, the authorizations of the use of military force that we're operating under are almost 20 <coughs> years old. Think about what was happening in the security threats to our nation and the world 20 years ago. They are very different than they are today. We have cyber threats, we have technology, we have things that we could not have even imagined. There are organizations that didn't exist then. Put another way, think about it like this, because technology plays a large role in this. It'd be like taking a computer from around 2000 or 2001 with the latest version of Norton antivirus software that knew how to protect from all of the things that were out there and plugging it in and expecting it to work today to protect us from the same things today. It doesn't work that way, and we shouldn't expect it to. And this has been a problem with presidents of both uh, parties uh, across years, taking action that was, that, 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 that the lines were a little bit gray because the, off, the authorities that we're operating under aren't clear and they don't apply. There are two AUMFs right now, one from 2001, was targeted at Al-Qaeda and, and its uh, su subsequent or, or terrorist organizations that have come out of that. And that's what we operate under. Now, those things are very different. And the 2002 AUMF, which has not been used, was against Saddam Hussein's Iraq. That doesn't exist anymore. We have got to stop defaulting to measures that are largely partisan and things that are easier because one party or the other has control and we have to get everyone at the table to do our jobs, to assert our voices as 
Congress to make these decisions based on what is happening now. And we also need to demand from this and any administration a clear plan and strategy that will ensure increased safety and that we aren't sending our young men and women to, to, for, to, uh, to fight foreign wars that will keep us there for another generation. But we have to do it the right way. We have to do this the right way. And that's why every time I think about something and I make decisions, it is not through what any one party wants to do, but it's about what's right. And I'm tired of defaulting to those places because it's not helpful and it's not good for us. It doesn't make any of us safer. So the bottom line is, what results in a safer and more secure environment for all of us and that puts fewer men and women in harm's way? We need to be thoughtful, we need to be strategic, and we need to have answers all around. So those are the reasons I made those decisions. I'm sure we'll have other questions. I'm happy to answer them. And I'll be happy to answer any other questions about what we're doing. But I really wanted to put those two things right out there, front and center. Because we've got a lot of work to do and we're gonna keep doing that, focusing on healthcare, focusing on so many things that matter in the coming year. And we can only do that if we continue to work together and step outside of the us versus them. Because divided government is hard, but it's a good thing. Because it means that we're questioning each other, but we've all gotta keep showing them to the table to do that. So I appreciate all of you being here today. I appreciate your presence and I'm looking forward to your questions. And I'm gonna let Trent come on over and I'll read the first number and we'll get started. Okay, I will read the last three numbers, 583, 583. All right, let's try another one. 545. Okay. Uh, Richard will come around with a question. I've got to turn I've got to turn my mic off so he can turn his on, so bear with us a second. Okay. Well, this is on a lighter note because we're gonna have a lot of heavy conversation in here today. But with your love of space, I'm interested in knowing would you ever consider going to space yourself? If you have the opportunity. Uh, and and thank you. That's a that's a that's a really good question. Um, sure, if, if the opportunity presented itself, I don't know that in, in my lifetime it will be able to. But that does open up a really important uh, important uh, line of thought because space is so very important. As the chair of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, and um, in my role on Armed Services, I I get to work in the area of space. But I think we're going to see increased opportunities um, to utilize space. First of all. We use it in a lot of ways that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, from, you know, who, who has cell phones or uh, smartphones in their pockets? I, I'd venture, uh, yeah, I, I see several people holding up two, right? Okay, so that's another thing that didn't exist 20 years ago, those smartphones that, that we're holding. Um, but, but those are all powered by space. And the technology that was there when anybody asked, hey, why do we do this research? Well, because a lot of the stuff that we're carrying around wouldn't have existed without the, us, us pushing the, the boundaries of space, and there's a lot of scientific research. In fact, um, healthcare advances. I love to talk about this because we take these things for granted. Um, there are a lot of new technology, including um, insulin pumps and, and other, other uh, medical devices that rely on GPS and other satellite and timing technology that are, have really benefited families. Um, I've talked to a lot of families of, that, that have children with type 1 diabetes that uh, they now have the ability to constantly monitor the, the, the blood sugar of the children and know so alarms will go off, so even when they're too young to monitor it themselves, so parents aren't having to wake up every two hours. So many things um, that it enables, but sure, why not? If I had the chance, I'd love to, thanks. Five, four, four. Right. Yes, sir, right, right there in the back. He'll, yes. he'll come your way. 
Uh, what would you say are the top three um, items on your agenda for Congress to accomplish in 2020? Okay, top three items. Let's start with the, the number one item is uh, addressing uh, prescription drug pricing. Uh, we passed HR3, and, and there are other healthcare things that we need to do, but I think number one is prescription drug pricing because we, we passed HR3 uh, in December, and I really hope that the, the Senate takes it up. But another reason that that is so important, and, and I want to highlight that, is that on January 1st, a handful of drug companies announced, hey, guess what we're doing? Increasing drug pricing yet again. Um, and so we have got to address this issue because last year we, uh, we did a study on especially insulin because diabetes impacts so many Oklahomans uh, and, and fifth district residents. It's I think 89,000 um, seniors in the district and I need to make sure I'm right on that. 89,000 seniors in the district and so many others. And the cost of insulin in Oklahoma has increased almost 200% in the last decade, 200%. Now we certainly don't want to stop innovation. We need to ensure that there's, there's enough money for, for companies to continue research and innovation, which means we also have to invest in, uh, and, and we have to make sure that NIH and other, other the cutting edge research is funded. But we also cannot continue down this path where families literally don't have the ability to get these life-saving drugs that they need um, they're making choices that nobody should have to make. So healthcare and protecting people and expanding access to healthcare in a smart, sustainable way is, is uh, top priority. Education um, is, is, as has been for a long time, uh, another top priority. Last year, we introduced uh, several pieces of legislation to address the skyrocketing cost of higher education and student loans and student loan debt. We have seen story after story after story of what that's doing to people I've heard uh, so many from so many people across the district and i think the way we can solve that it's not an all or nothing solution we don't have to wipe out everybody's student loan debt we don't have to uh, give everything away for free but what we do need to do is make it reasonable and accessible and make sure our students are being taken advantage of and and the last thing is a, is is a little bit broader category and it's to make sure that we do our jobs and get the government funded and make sure that things are working. I'm gonna keep working on things that are important for job creation and economic growth and development, but here in, here in Oklahoma and, and around the country, uh, we know how important it is to ensure that um, businesses have predictability and sustainability as they're moving forward. Uh, the, if we're not doing our jobs to make sure that we're passing appropriations bills, that we're getting those important things done, that it impacts all of us. And, and, and those things together, education helps to create uh, opportunities for, for people to get good paying jobs and lifting, lifting that up. So working on those three things, uh, uh, those have to be the, the top priorities for, for 2020. Thank you. Five, four, six. Five, six, four. Yes, sir. Right over there, Richard. Hi, um, so one of the questions that is like up for debate as far as like the presidential election is the universal basic income, and I wonder what your thoughts are on the issue. Well, first of all, I wanna say thank you for being here. Um, and I see lots of, lots of young faces and faces of different ages um, and, and backgrounds in the crowd. I think it's so important for you to be engaged. Um, I, I, I am not, um, I'm, I'm not a, a fan of, of universal basic income. Um, because I think that there are other ways that we can and should be solving problems that, that help us to create more opportunities uh, uh, for, for people uh, that have far too often been left out. Um, and that includes uh, addressing educational opportunities uh, for job and skills training, uh, ensuring, that, uh, ensuring that people have pathways to success if, if, if there are barriers. 
Um, and I think that we can create things that are more workable and systems that are more sustainable in the long run uh, that, don't, that don't require that. Uh, I know that there are a lot of challenges that our communities are faced with, but one of the biggest things I think for people that are kind of teetering in that place of are they, they're barely making it, is that so many of our programs have these sharp cliffs, right? If somebody's making um, just this much uh, money that they qualify and suddenly they're making 50 cents an hour more, they lose everything, right? Well, okay, if you're making 50 cents an hour more and you were making it with help and support with childcare or some other supports that help put food on the table, 50 cents an hour more isn't gonna suddenly allow you to pay for everything, right? But it might allow you to do a little bit more, right? So we've gotta do things I think that are, are smart and that incentivize rather than disincentivize uh, taking that next step forward. Because I've heard from too many people um, and this is really heartbreaking. Well, my boss wanted to give me a raise, but if I took that raise, I would lose help on childcare, and that raise wouldn't be enough to offset the childcare. So I think there are other ways that we can solve some of those issues, and we do need to tackle them. Uh, but, but to me, that, that's not the best way to do it. Thank you. Five seven seven. Right over here. I just wonder your opinion on lowering the voting age. Oh, lowering the voting age. Okay. Um, thank you for asking about that. I, I actually um, I actually think that's a really interesting idea. Uh, I, I would love to look at smart, intentional ways that we can increase partic voter participation amongst young people because voters between the ages of 18 and 24 have the lowest voter participation rate uh, of, of any age group. And, and to me, that's, that's really sad because all of the decisions that we're making impact all of us, young and old. And, and I think it's been done in some places that, that is, uh, that is has, has shown some interesting benefits. Like in, I think, Scotland, they, they reduced it to 17. Uh, and, and I think it would depend on how we structured it, but I'm, I'm definitely open to a conversation about that. Um, be, but because I, think that, uh, because I think that we've got to encourage young people's voices uh, to, to be heard and to be educated about it. Uh, and I think we've got, to, uh, we've got to do more to get more of us involved rather than less of us involved. I think. Um, one of the things that's really troubling to me uh, is that uh, is that our rates of voter participation have gone down and down and down over the last few decades. And in 2014, um, we saw the lowest, here in Oklahoma, the lowest voter turnout of any statewide election since we've been keeping track of that. And, and I think that hurts all of us. Um, the more of us that are involved, it doesn't mean we're all gonna agree, but uh, it does mean that we have uh, we have more people being involved in the process of these things that impact all of us. Uh, so I, I'd love to see young people get involved and, um, and, and we certainly need to encourage um, early voter registration, which you can do here in Oklahoma. If you're gonna turn 18 before the next election, but the registration cutoff is between, uh, is, is before your birthday, you can register early. So I think that's one way, and there are some other ways like that, that right now we can encourage more young people to vote. Five, five, zero. He's headed your way. This is, this is Richard's exercise for the day. Or at least part of it. Ran on a platform as an independent voice for Oklahoma. I'm not really sure I've seen that so far with you, but you touched on the fact that you've been the Constitution. We see problems in Virginia as we sit here today with gun control. Uh, so if you're going to defend the Constitution, will you defend our right, our Second Amendment right? Or are you going to change your stance when Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, comes to you and says, hey, we're going to get rid of the Second Amendment? Also, uh, term limits. I mean, we, I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, independent, 
40, 50 years. And what has happened? Zero. Other than more laws that work burdens on the citizens of the United States of America. It's a joke. Congress and Senate is a joke. You, that, not you, I'm not accusing you, but because you've only started. But they, they, the absurdity of what we're going through in this country is absurd. The fact that people are cheering for a, an international terrorist and trashing Donald Trump, and I don't care, it doesn't matter, it was Barack Obama who destroyed an international terrorist who has murdered not just hundreds, but thousands and maimed thousands of American soldiers. He invented the IED and how to place it. And we have Hollywood elites, we have leftists, jumping up and down, oh my gosh, why did you go? They're, they're making this guy martyr. The absurdity of that, is, I, I can't even believe that. Also, the irony that the party of abortion, the Democrats, is holding a town hall at a children's drink center blows my mind. So, will you please make your little so, simple there little were, questions? There were, there were several things in there, and I'll, I'll do my best, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna address a few things. First of all, I, I think, I think, sir, some of the things that you said are, are part of the things that trouble trouble me about uh, about how we're talking to each other, painting with a broad stroke. Uh, everybody that falls into this category of that, um, I absolutely make decisions based on uh, looking at everything, and I don't I don't just check a box, which is why I I will I I didn't vote. I, just just this week, for example, voted against that resolution because I felt like it was more uh, it was more intended to send a, a message that, that wasn't like let's fix this, but we we need to. But let me uh, there were there's a lot in there, and I'll try to I'll, I'll try to get to Second Amendment. Uh, I don't think I don't want to, and I don't know of anybody that does wants to do away with the Second Amendment to, to the Constitution and and to limit responsible and to stop responsible legal gun owners from, from owning their guns. I, I, I really don't know anyone who does. And I just have to be honest with you. I don't, nobody said, now that people have different opinions, and I probably have different opinions than some of my other colleagues uh, about how and, and what we do. But that's, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma in a family uh, that, you know, hunted, and I know how to use a gun, and I was taught respect. But we also, I also know that we need to have laws that are intended to make us safer, and they have to be intentional. And that doesn't mean that we're that anybody should just go out and just round up everything. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about as laws that are targeted and intended to make us safer um, and and protect people who are um, responsible gun owners. So that that's that that's that one. There's a lot of things. The second thing about uh, Suleimani, I don't know of anyone who was cheering uh, or who was mourning his death. And, and in fact, I, I really don't. And that's what's troubling to me is that to hear people say that, look, he, you heard me say this earlier, he's, he's a terrorist and a murderer and we should not mourn his death. And we have a, a responsibility to, to make sure that when our government is taking actions that we as a Congress understand and that there is a plan and information and we have the, the right to checks and balances. But I'm really troubled but when, when, when some people are saying that, uh, that, that, that people love terrorists. No, that's not the case. We may disagree on how we address some of these issues, but that does not mean I or anybody I know spend a second mourning the loss of, of someone who has taken the thousands and thousands of lives. And you may not believe that, but that's troubling to me because uh, because it's not true. Like, it's just not. I, I don't know any of my colleagues, none of them, who thought it was a, a bad thing that this man was dead. So so I just, I just, I feel the need to say that. And I'm, I'm gonna ask questions of any administration about decisions that are made because I think the Obama administration made some questionable decisions about how and when they did things. I question that. I have the right and I should be, as an elected representative, questioning any administration. And I will, because if we stop having those that back and forth and having three branches of government, 
I, I think it's dangerous, and, and I can support people when, when I agree, and we can work together on things when it's the right thing to do, but I, I just think that that is, I, I think that is a, a, a challenge. So I, I know we're gonna, there's, there's, a, there's, a lot, there's a lot in here, and I wanna make sure we get to a, a number of, of other questions, too. Um, so, so the, you know, to, to several of the other things, I'm just gonna keep making decisions um, because in, in the way that I know how, which is a thoughtful, intentional way by reading the bills, uh, by being thoughtful about the way that we, that we implement legislation, term limits, that's, that's one of the other things that you mentioned. Okay, so let's talk about term limits for a moment. I think term limits for executive uh, branches um, are important, like the governor here in our statewide elected, any executive branch, because that is one person that has a lot of decision-making authority. I think that when we're talking about uh, legislative office, that we absolutely have term limits, and they're, they're called elections. But I'm, I'm troubled by the idea of term limits because I've seen the Im impacts here in Oklahoma, and if you'll bear with me for a second, I'll tell you, tell you why that is. Because we see a decrease in, in voter turnout because it, what ends up is seats get safe, right? And okay, it doesn't matter if I'm the opposite party, everybody's gonna vote and I'm not gonna have to get engaged. But one of the things it does is it puts more power in the hands of lobbyists who are paid by special interests. I've seen it firsthand because it takes a while to you know, get, understand how things work and get legislation and see what's happened before. And, and it's getting a, a, a skill. Now that's not to say I think people should stay for you know, however long, but that's where being engaged and being out and, and having conversations is really important. So I think the answer to people who aren't paying attention, who are kind of settling in and just writing people off, is that, is that citizens, voters, need to get more involved. And, and have conversations with people. So that's where I am on term limits, and it's because, honestly, I've seen it. It, puts, it, it, it ends up putting all of the information in the hands of people that were in there, and they, they go out and they become lobbyists, and they have, the, they have the expertise, and they come back in, and they're being paid by special interests. So it puts a lot more power in the hands of special interests. And, and, and I think that's, a, that's something that's really troubling to me from just a, a standpoint of, um, do we want to put more power in the hands of special interests? I don't think so. I don't think so. And um, well, I, 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 I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting any. So let, let's, let's, let's back up. We're not. I'm not going to do a back and forth because that's that's exactly what I ask us not to do. And I'll be happy to have more of a conversation with you afterwards. But I will say this: I have a real problem with these dark money groups coming in because every single dollar that that, that comes into any campaign or anything that has reporting requirements has to be reported with transparency. Transparency is the answer to a lot of these things. Dark money groups where there is no transparency, you don't know where the money's coming from, you don't know who's behind it, those are problematic. And we've got to address those. And that's why we passed, that's one of the things we did in HR1. Uh, we, you know, we've been done a lot of those things. So I, I, I'm with you, I don't like a lot of this, but I think there's ways that we could solve it. But I, I really am troubled by this idea that um, all, Democrats are this, or all Republicans are this, because I I have friends of both parties, and um, some of my my old, oldest, nearest, and dearest friends in the world um, are Republicans. I've, I've had friends of yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I'm 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 glad I'm glad you're here, and that's why I hold these. That's why I hold so many of these. So, and and I appreciate that. Um, and and you know what, you and I, sir, are probably going to disagree. On a number of things and that's okay that's good because those are conversations that are important for us to have um, but I also really want us to have more of those conversations that fall outside of that painting everybody with a broad brush because then I, that's where we can get to the solutions I think so I appreciate you being here and appreciate your questions thank you okay 565 Thank you. Um, my question is about DACA. As you know, the Supreme Court is going to reach a decision between now and June. So I'm wondering how Congress is working together to help DACA recipients get on a path to citizenship. Uh, so I'll start out by answering what the House has done, <laughs> because I can. 
answer what the House has done last year, we passed a, a bill uh, out of the House of Representatives that is currently sitting in the Senate, as are many other bills, sadly, because um, the Senate just simply has not taken a lot of bills up. Uh, so there are a lot of things that um, I really wish McConnell would take up because they're important. And that bill addressed uh, DACA recipients uh, or individuals who were brought here. Uh, as they, they didn't choose to come here, they were brought here as children and this is, this is their home. And it would create a path and clarity. Uh, I am concerned about that and, and support uh, a solution that will protect them. I, I know so many young people uh, that this is hey, what's up? where they've grown up. They, they've never lived anywhere else. This is their home. They were educated here and they started businesses, they're teachers, they're uh, professionals. They've done so much. And, and I think that this is a problem that, that we can solve together. Our, our immigration system is broken in a lot of different ways, in, in a lot of different ways. And we don't necessarily agree on how we fix all of it, but I think that DACA is a place that we can and we should start. And I will continue to advocate for that, and I hope that the Senate will take it up. Um, and, and I think we've got to fix it. But this is a place where I think many of us agree we've got to do this uh, for these young people. Five, six, three. Hi, Congresswoman. Um, I moved here less than a year ago, um, and so it's a pleasure to be here in the state of Oklahoma. I have a question for you um, regarding your campaign and your um, congressional office. Is I noticed that um, your logos are very similar to both your campaign office, um, both your campaign and your congressional office. And I was questioning whether that was like legal or ethical as something to do um, that would cause confusion amongst uh, voters um, or residents of the district on um, whether that's the right thing you should do. Um, but they are not, they're not the same. Uh, they have, uh, they do have similar colors, but everything has been uh, approved and has gone through approval through franking and through the house. Uh, they, one, they very clearly, one very clearly says um, that uh, it's congressional office and you'll, and many, most of our colleagues have their own individual logos. So uh, everything is uh, above board and has been approved. Uh, oh, that's true. Franking is is the thank you for the for the house. Um, uh, the uh, it, everything has to go through an approval process before we can post anything, before we can send anything to ensure that it is uh, that it is in in accordance with all of our legal and ethical rules. And everything we send out has to be approved in that way. So if we don't send anything out to any constituents before it goes through a whole process through the House of Representatives and that it is determined that it meets all of the requirements and, and before we're able to send it out. Whether it's digital or printed, every single thing has to be approved. Um, 573. I should say the 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 way the, the way that it looks has to be approved. They don't uh, the, the office doesn't monitor what we uh, what we what our opinions are but that it complies with the, the laws. It, I just want to be clear on that, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, I'm uh, old and retired, so I had a lot of time to watch the hearing. And uh, if I recall, there were 17 people called as witnesses, and uh, primarily after it went to days and days and days and stuff, all these people were asked at the very end of their testimony if they had witnessed or heard any of the charges being brought against President Trump. To the 17, no one said they really heard or seen any of that. So everything that we did was for no avail there. And that didn't satisfy, I'm gonna say the left. So now, what are the two things that you voted for for impeachment, bring him up on charges for? So the two, the two articles of impeachment, one was obstruction of Congress. And part of the reason that, that we didn't have a lot of the information was um, obstruction. Uh, this, the administration 
did not comply with any request for information, with any issued subpoenas. Uh, they didn't provide any documentation, uh, and 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 they they instructed uh, administration uh, employees not to comply. That that is a definition of of, of, of obstruction. Uh, the abuse of power, the information, and the and, and that was gathered, and, and when when we're gathering information, when I read through everything, I, I read the information, I reviewed it, um, clearly indicated that the administration, and including public statements, um, asked a foreign government to interfere in our elections, and that was ultimately what we came down to, and that was, that is an abuse of power. Asking a foreign government to interfere in our elections is an abuse of power. I got one bad here, but you said that when you first started, that President Donald Trump had abused that. He was not in office at the time. That Sir, no, those two questions, the abuse of power was the President <coughs> requesting the interference of a foreign power in our elections. And, and, and I'll be happy to talk to you more um, afterwards. I'll be happy to stay after. But the, after reviewing the evidence um, and, and, and looking at everything, that was the, the decisions that, that I came to. And, and believe me, this was, this was not something that, uh, that I came into desiring. Um, and, and, and so that's, that was a lot of thought, a lot of review, a lot of, of, of reviewing everything uh, before I made that decision. So I appreciate you being here, and I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. Five, eight, four. They think I'm a conservative. <laughs> uh, this notion of people, if you don't agree 100% with somebody, then they're against you. If, you're, if you only agree 90%, that 10% you don't agree, they're against you. So I just want to commend you for having these town halls and starting these conversations and, and, and allowing people to ask questions. Um, I think that, that that's a great start, and, 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 and whenever I hear things, like for instance, uh, the gentleman had mentioned that people are, are mourning and cheering, or, or, or you know, they were against the death, and then I also heard people clapping about that, and we know that it's not true, and I just, it, it, it is bothersome to me. Um, my, my question got asked earlier about your agenda for the top three questions, but, um, so I guess my question got, asked, uh, I, I would just say this, I am a young professional, I'm a registered Republican, and I see how you answer things, and I see you put so much thought into things that I plan to vote for you in November. So. Thank you for being here and for your comments, and, and, and especially for, for, for the, the, the comments about um, us being able to have a conversation. Uh, uh, it, it makes me very sad uh, when we stop talking to each other, um, and, and it, I think it stops us from coming to solutions on some things that are really important uh, for, for communities that cross political, socioeconomic, in all different <coughs> spectrums, uh, and, and we've got to get back to that. Um, that's one of the reasons that I, I do take my time, and that doesn't mean we're all going to agree. Um, honestly, we, we may agree 20% of the time, we may agree 80% of the time, but chances are we're not going to agree 100% of the time. Uh, but I will keep, the, the only thing that I can guarantee is that I'll keep showing up and doing my best to be thoughtful and intentional and not just make a decision because of whoever put their name on a bill, and I definitely won't be making a decision because somebody tells me, you got to vote for this, you got to vote against it. Um, because if it's the wrong thing to do, I don't care who you are, I'm not going to do it. Uh, 
Okay, uh, five, four, seven. And yes, I actually have a couple comments before I ask my question. I just want to say that if you haven't seen Democrat leadership mourning the death of this terrorist, you haven't been on Twitter. And then other than that, you made a comment about equal branches of government, and you mentioned the House, the Congress, and the Senate. And I thought it was judicial, legislative, and executive, which includes the White House, and he does have like, you know, to say so. My thing is, I'm a former independent. I voted for Barack Obama twice. I voted for President Trump in 2016 and I'll vote for President Trump in 2020. My husband is a 280% disabled combat veteran from Iraq. He completely supports everything that the president has done. So my question for you is, um, the overwhelming majority of your constituents don't support impeachment, yet you voted for it. I recall you standing in all white with Nancy Pelosi and the squad in protest of President Trump during his inauguration. My questions are, why are you working for Nancy Pelosi instead of your constituents and Oklahomans? And considering you voted yes for the president's impeachment, your president's impeachment, do you consider him a criminal or a traitor to America? Thank you. So let me let me address uh, several of those things. First of all, um, co-equal branches, it's judicial, executive, and legislative, and the House and the Senate are one branch of that, to be clear, if, if it came across as other than that. That's not what I attended. They're three co-equal branches. So just to be clear, that's that's what I intended. I meant the House and the Senate are one branch. Uh, so so uh, apologies if there was a confusion there. Um, so to to your to your other to your other statements and questions, I fundamentally disagree. Um, I have not seen any of my colleagues mourning the death. They may disagree, and I actually may disagree with some of them about their approach. Quite frankly, as a member of the Armed Services Committee, I understand it is important that we ensure that our that our armed services have the resources they need but it's also uh, because I'm sure I don't have to tell you the toll it takes when 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 our families are making sacrifices and we're grateful for those sacrifices and they are needed um, it, because I wish that it were a 100 percent peaceful world but sadly it's it's not and and that's why I don't want to unnecessarily tie I don't want to tie anyone's hands to respond to threats, but I do think that it is incredibly important that we, as, as, as one of the co-equal branches, are involved in these decisions, are informed about the information that the decisions are being made um, thoughtfully. And quite to me, questioning someone does not mean that, I, um, that, that I'm never going to, to go, we have to question, right? I think it's important to question, and we need to see the information because, you know, we've seen uh, problems with people, regardless of party, doing things that they shouldn't, so we have to question. Oversight and, and investigation is, is important, and we have to be able to do that. Um, and and so let, let me talk about a couple of different things. I, I, I don't make decisions. You've heard me talk about why I make decisions. And it wasn't to un, undo anything, and it wasn't, it wasn't because I am out to get anyone. I'm making decisions based on the facts and the information in front of me. And I will work. I will continue as, as as we're going forward. I will continue to work with with the administration um, when when it's in the best interest of Oklahomans and, and do things that, that we need to do. And I will stand up and question when that is the case. I would do that either way. Wearing white, just to clarify any confusion, women got the right to vote a hundred years ago. We were celebrating the fact that women got the right to vote. It was not in protest. It was in celebration, and you can shake your head, but I was there. Um, uh, well, they weren't my. Okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna go back and forth on this. I'm gonna tell you why I was wearing white. I was wearing white because this country is now 200 and will be this year 243 years old officially. But women didn't get the right to vote until 100 years ago. I think that's something to celebrate, and I'm gonna stand up and wear white to celebrate the fact that women, half of our population, should have the right to vote. You asked me, and, and, and I'm just gonna go back and say, I listen to you, so I'm gonna ask that you listen to me, and if we wanna have a conversation afterwards, we can do that. You asked me why I'm wearing white. I wore white because for a hundred and, uh, almost 150 years, Women didn't have the right to vote. And it is important that we have the right to vote and we should celebrate that. 
and I'm going to celebrate that. And no one tells me what to do. I, I, I'm, and 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 I know it's easy to I, I I know it's easy to say that, but I don't fall in line with just one person. And I make decisions very thoughtfully and intentionally. And and I understand that you may disagree with the conclusion I came to, but. I have been thoughtful and intentional at every step of the way. I will continue to do that. And, and I look at the facts. I read the information. And, 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 and that is, that's what I'm doing. And so, but I'm not going to go back and forth with you anymore, ma'am. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not going to. That was my question. My question was. I, I, ju I did just I did just answer your question, ma'am. It was yes or no. I did just answer your question, ma'am. Why I made that decision to vote for the articles of impeachment, and I'll go back to asking you respectfully that I listen to you, and and I ask that that, that we keep this, um, and then we'll we're going to move on. And I answered your question about why I made that vote. Five six eight. I guess I have a question. Uh, first of all, uh, are you going to uh, support our, pre our president in the coming year? And you know, I know that you, uh, I read a lot on your articles and things. I'm a person of common sense, and I've been watching some of the hearings and stuff. And for anybody who's got half a brain and watching some of these hearings that they've had, it was just a joke. And Every time they got up there, they turned anything that uh, President Trump has done and that's good, they turned it into something bad. You know, they, they always put the negative on it. Always. Every time. Even CNN's worse. But they just, uh, I just need to know, yeah, are you going to support him? Uh, even once this, what, this, last, this next year, are you going to stand by it? Some of the articles he did. He did this last year and a few years. Uh, I know it's Nancy Pelosi and I'd like to sit down. They don't support him. They don't support anything he does. They, they object to everything he does and they've tried to impeach him even before he's uh, president. So are you going to support him? That's what I'm asking. So let me, let, you, you, you mentioned a few things in there and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to, to answer those. Um, one, I have reached across the aisle and working on issues and we've worked with the administration and the president to, to get things done. Uh, we, we, I worked hard and I was a voice pushing last year on the USMCA to ensure that we stayed at the table when we got some improvements because one of the problems with NAFTA, and I know you didn't ask about this, but I'm just going to give you a few examples of, of, of things that we worked on. A few of the problems is it didn't have uh, the ability to enforce the provisions which meant if somebody violated it, you couldn't go back and, and go after them. There were other provisions that were pro that were problematic, and we worked on that, and we, we got it done. And it passed the House with almost 400 votes, extremely bipartisan. We worked with the administration for, for months to get that done, and the Senate still hasn't taken that up. Uh, we got the NDAA done. We worked with Republicans in the Senate and with the administration to ensure that we got the defense authorization bill done, including modernizing uh, modernizing our forces and, and things like getting the, the, the space force, which I know that sounds funny. I, I do want to address that for a second. The reason it is important is because space is a critical component of our nation's ability to defend itself, and we need to ensure that people who are working in that arena have the special skills and understanding that we're bringing it all together. Um, and that was a priority um, of the White House, but also happened to be a priority of both Democrats and Republicans in the House that had been working on it a long time, with, and, and so we worked on those. I'm going to work with the President and with, and with the administration when, when it, it is something that, that, we're, that is important, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. We're not always going to agree. I'm, I'm not always going to be on the same side, and I don't just support uh, anyone, but I am going to continue to work because there are too many things that, that are important. Um, in my committees, I work with people on both sides of the aisle uh, to ensure that we're passing out bipartisan legislation. I'm going to keep trying to do that. Uh, so I will, I will make a commitment to making the best effort I can. And that's why, look, I have a problem with some of the things that people did leading up to that, and some of those, some of that 
um, attitude. I don't like the hyper-partisanship on either side. I think it's dangerous. I think it keeps us from getting things done. So do I disagree with some of my colleagues on the left that are doing some of that? Yeah, I do. Um, that's why I don't do it. You're not gonna see me out there doing it. I, do I disagree with some, some people on the right who are, are doing the same thing? Absolutely, I just think we need to get the work done. And so the answer to your question is, I'm gonna work with the president and the administration as much as I can. I'd love to work with them on prescription drug pricing. He said um, that that's an important thing that we need to get done. We passed a bill, the Senate has it. Um, if they don't like the way we fixed it, then um, I would be, I'd be happy for them to come and bring a bill and then we can negotiate it out like we did the things that, that, that we, we got done. So that's, that's where I am on that and I hope that, hope that answers your question. Thank you. Five, six, one. Um, this is a question about the democratic institutional leadership of the Democratic National Committee, and so called guard, so called elite. Uh, I've been troubled by what I perceive as uh, certain, what you might call, lack of enthusiasm on their part for you know, what I think are desperately needed new blood and new ideas you know, among Democratic legislators. And I was just curious how, e how easy is it or difficult to preserve your autonomy as a Democratic uh, legislator in those, under those circumstances? Well, that's that's interesting. They don't, um, I'm trying to figure out how to answer because they don't really tell us, I don't, I'm not involved in any of that, so they don't really that, that tell us uh, what to do or anything. The Democratic, like the National Committee, like they just, they do their own thing. Um, but I think, here's what, here's the way I will answer it. I got here um, because I worked with Oklahomans. Not because there were any any outside uh, groups that came in and made the decision. We worked really hard, and I listened to people and knocked doors, and and, and and that's where I am working for Oklahomans. And I think it is, I think that it is easier to stand up and say, no, this is not the right thing for my constituents and my community um, when. I'm out there talking to you and hearing from you and working with people because I we knocked a lot of doors. I talked to a lot of people, so I can say I can look somebody in the eye and say that this is. I hear about healthcare; they're concerned about this. Uh, and additionally, I think that in places where seats are safe, either uh, very very strongly Republican or very very strongly Democrat, it is um, harder. So seats that are that are more closely divided, like this one, where we've got. Um, a, a lot of people who have thoughts on all different sides of issues. Um, I'm going to keep standing up and saying, this may be true in my district, that's not true, and it doesn't work, and I'm not going to do that. I'll tell you that I don't take anybody's uh, talking points, uh, and, and, and I'm not going to because it's, it, it's not, it doesn't apply to Oklahoma. So I think it depends on the person. Uh, I think it depends on where they're from and how engaged they are with their communities, and that's why I think it's so important to be out talking to people because otherwise it's easy to get disconnected uh, from what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Five, six, nine. Five, five, six. Right back. Hang on, he'll, he'll come over with the so um, as we've been just sitting here talking, I can see some evidence that some of my dear fellow Oklahomans have been victims of some of these uh, psychological operations or disinformation campaigns. That's, that's keeping them from I mean, sliding into post-truth all over the place here. So what can we do as citizens to um, help improve media literacy and help people to follow the news more closely and to um, combat some of this noise that's going around on Facebook and Twitter and frankly, even in uh, just our regular media environment. Well, thank you for being here and for your question. I think one of the things that we absolutely need to do is talk to each other. And I think you're doing it, part of it, by coming out and having a conversation. 
Uh, and, and I think that's one of the things that is, it, that is so very important, um, is that when we have conversations uh, with each other, it, it, can, it can change dynamics. Um, you know, I think one of the things that troubles me about what's happening um, in, in, in the modern way that we consume a lot of media is that we're, we're more isolated than, I, than, than is healthy. And that we're not, it's, it's easier to shut people off or shut people down. The 24 hour news cycle keeps us kind of on edge because things happen so quickly, we don't have the time to really take a moment and understand what's behind something, what's, what's going on. And so I think it is that continued dialogue and, and, and looking for um, ways to understand in a little more depth what's happening. And, and I do think good, uh, thoughtful, investigative journalism takes time and, and it is important for us to um, ensure that we still have a, a free and fair press. Uh, but I am concerned by divisions and things that just shut us down, that push, push us apart. And, and so I think that part of it is having conversations, asking questions, um, and opening a dialogue, and um, stepping outside of, of your normal uh, environments is something that I, is, is really critical in that process. It doesn't mean we're all gonna agree. Um, I mean, you know, I, I just, should we. nor should we. I actually think it's important for us to disagree. Disagreements are healthy. I think about it in the context of um, building something like a business plan, right? Or you're, you're building a business, you're thinking about going into a new, uh, a new area, or you, what, are, what are we gonna do? Well, you've gotta, you gotta red team it, right? You gotta think about, okay, what are the strengths and the weaknesses and the possible challenges, and you want people, you come and you've got this great plan. Well, if nobody questions it, how are you gonna see where the holes are? That's why it's good to have people with a variety of different opinions and thoughts and perspectives coming at these issues, because sometimes somebody who's had an experience or has understand something that I may not can come and say, uh, hey, have you thought about this or have you considered this? this? If this happens, then there's this impact. That's why I think it's good for us to disagree, but we have to be able to show up and, and talk about some of these things in order to, to get to those better solutions. So that's my way of of addressing that and really getting down to the source documents is, is one of the other things. So um, I, I think that was the that was the last of, of the uh, that was the I don't know which ones they were. Um, that was the last of, of the of the questions um, and I really uh, appreciate um, all of you being here today. Uh, nobody else um, had any questions in there. I will be happy to stick around. Um, and did you, uh, we've got, we've got, hang on a second, he'll bring you the, uh, he'll bring you the, uh, the, the microphone. So unfortunately, back to the uh, war powers vote that you took. And, and I, I, I just want to understand a little bit about that. Now, you did hear the briefing that the administration gave. Was there any eminence to any of that, number one? And number two, you know, we have the unintended consequences. We just killed a whole airplane full of people because the president decided that it was important to him to beat Obama's record on killing bad guys. Now, I don't, I don't mourn the bad guys. Resolution that, that we passed is, is not a binding resolution. There's already a duty under the War Powers Act for the, the, the president to come to Congress and, and say why, why they took an action. And, and they brought that information. Now, having said that, I still have outstanding questions, and 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 those are questions that we are still working to get answers to. Um, I don't know that we can point to a direct correlation of, about the the shooting down of the, the flight, which, as I understand it, was not intentional, but um, and is it is tragic with the loss of those lives. Um, but I'm not prepared to to go in, into those things. I am concerned about what happens next. I am concerned about finding out more information about uh, the intelligence, the information, the decision making that led up to it. And um, that's why I believe we need to take uh, action about uh, and the authorization of the use of military force. Because the, uh, the authorities that, that they were operating under, or they're, they're, the, the, the administration is saying that they were operating under, are those two, uh, the old uh, authorization to use the military force, which as I said earlier, 
almost 20 years old different circumstances that's why so this was a non-binding resolution and i was concerned too that you weren't getting many people from both sides of the aisle even though all there are many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle we have questions and the administration still owes us uh, a plan a strategy answers to more of the questions and we have the ability uh, still under the war powers act to that he cannot just go in further uh, without without proving um, imminence and several other things. So that's why, because that resolution didn't address what had already happened and doesn't necessarily stop anything further. It, it's not a binding resolution, right? I want to fix the law, and I want every I want other people along. We we've been living this endless war because we know what happened when previous decisions were made without a long-term strategy that's part of what we're seeing has been coming out in some of the information on the on the papers around afghanistan and we're still we're still in many of these places because there legitimately are threats to our safety and security that we have to address but without a long-term plan and strategy to make us safer there it's very difficult to get out and without updating the authorities to reflect the challenges and, and the dangers to our country, it just keeps it open and we aren't fixing it. So that's why I came down to that because that was a non-binding resolution. We can and should be taking up these hard questions. Earlier this summer, I supported two amendments and language that was in the, in the House version of the Armed Services Bill that would that repeat that would have repealed the 2002 AUMF? It didn't get included. The Senate opposed it. It didn't get included in the final version, um, and then the, and then would amend and put some more specific parameters around the 2001 resolutions, specifically saying that it didn't apply to Iran because the 2001 applied to Al Qaeda and its subsequent organizations. I have been taking action to try to to limit that, but that that resolution did not get us further down that pathway of my, the ultimate goal of making Americans safer and doing so in a smart um, and sustainable way. And, and that, I mean, that's what it came down to, to me. And we, we're, we're, not, we're not done and we shouldn't be done, right? Because the threats aren't going away, but neither is the fact that the authorities we're using are further and further in our rear view mirror in terms of of what they're addressing. And, and Congress really needs to take action and have these difficult conversations. And they're hard. And, and we don't get to fix this if it's so lopsided. And, and so that for me, and, and I'm on armed services, we keep going, I keep going to breakings, believe me. I'm asking a lot of questions. We still need answers. And we need to see a plan. We need to see a strategy. We need to understand what, what what, what, what was there. I'm not finished, but that didn't fix it. So, I mean, that's where my brain is. It goes to this really pragmatic place, like, okay, so we've got this problem, and how do we fix it? What is the solution? What is the legal authority? How do we get there? How do we actually make it work? And that's where I come from, because we have to make sure that we're doing the right things, we have the ability to respond when somebody attacks us or respond to imminent threats. And again, I still have questions, but we're gonna keep asking those questions, but we have to fix it in the short and the long run. So that's that's where I came down to um, on, on this issue. And, and it wasn't just saying, hey, do whatever you want, but the War Powers Act is still in, in full force and effect. And we've received the information, they cannot just go in, but we need to see de-escalation, and I'm glad we've seen some de-escalation, but we need to know that there's a continued plan for a path of both safety and de-escalation so that we're not recklessly going into another forever war. Because that's not good for any of us. Well, <laughs> yes, because I'm gonna wave a magic wand and make all uh, 535, uh, 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 435 uh, House members and 100 senators yeah, my plan is to do what I have been doing and advocating for it amongst my colleagues and raising this as an issue and I'm not the only one. And, and to do everything in my personal power to ensure that we actually do this. 
Um, as much as I can do, I will do. So if I could wave a magic wand to make it happen, man, that would be, you know, that'd be great. But no, I'm, I'm going to keep advocating for it because it's important and, and we really need to do it. So thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you for, uh, for your thoughts, for your questions, uh, for your interest. Uh, we will have many, many more of these to come. Uh, I don't plan on, on uh, discontinuing these, these town halls anytime soon. Um, but I will stick around if you have questions or, or something that you, you want to discuss that you didn't feel comfortable discussing um, in front of a room and cameras. I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and once again, thank you so much. And uh, please be safe out there at going back into the cold and stay warm and um, have, have a great day. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Reginald Mack once again with RMC News. Uh, just wrapped up here at the Representative Horn Town Hall meeting, and so um, they had a few small turnout of people that were here. But and once again, one of the things I appreciated uh, actually being here is that you didn't have any pre screen questions. Yours truly actually had the second question uh, that was asked today, and um, we had people from across the political spectrum. And I felt that it was just really important to show uh, show this particular event with no filters. A lot of times we get a lot of sound bites, etc. But you know, here in this particular forum, uh, once again, you have no filter that is there. Uh, no, like little sound bites. You get to hear things in context, so that way that you can make an educated decision on who you want to support. Uh, as you're aware that we do have our election that will be coming up in November. Uh, Representative Horn, along with all of our representatives here in the state of Oklahoma on the national level, uh, will be up for election. Uh, then uh, obviously, you know, the Senate, etc. And plus we have our state elections and obviously the big kahuna uh, dealing with the presidential election as well. Uh, RFC News will be here once again throughout this election season to provide coverage, unfiltered coverage of uh, candidates as they hit the state of Oklahoma, etc. Or just with our represent elected representatives as well, whether it's going to be on a local, state, or on a national level. So uh, once again, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, if you know of any sort of events, etc., that are going on in the state of Oklahoma uh, that you feel that needs some coverage, please reach out to us, let us know, uh, message us via email. You can always get us through face, uh, get me via Facebook or Mary. Um, so that way that, you know, we might be able to go through and provide some coverage there for you, uh, things that media outlets might not be able to go out and cover. So once again, thank you once again for tuning in. Once again, my name is Reginald Macklin. Hope you have a great rest of the day. Tune in to RMC News and subscribe below.